Hello, I'm Will. Welcome to Research Pod. Clinical electrophysiology, the application of electricity to monitor or produce a physiological effect in a person, seems such a core part of any modern hospital stay that it's almost surprising to think of how new it really is. As it stands today, devices and techniques have grown more accurate and less invasive, to the point that these life-saving technologies are practically commonplace. Today we're speaking with Ben Sherlock, Professor of Medicine at the University of Oklahoma, USA, about his role in this part of medical history, and why his dual roles in both clinical cardiology and basic science have been so valuable. Professor Sherlock, thank you so much for your time today and for taking this opportunity to talk with us. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk with you. Just by way of introduction, if we could hear a brief biography and what are some of the personal highlights of your contributions in physiology, electrophysiology, and research as a whole. I received my PhD in 1964 at the Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. I did my postdoctoral work at Columbia University under the tutelage of Dr. Brian Hoffman, who was at the time one of the um, most uh, the foremost uh, figure in uh, cardiac electrophysiology. Clinical electrophysiology was not known at that time. As a matter of fact, the work that I did both at Columbia University and then at the Staten Island Public Health Service Hospital, we were able to do a, a singular type of work in which we used a catheter that we could introduce into the heart to record from a specific critical site of uh, the cardiac conduction system called the Hispundle, named after Wilhelm Hiss, that lies between the upper chambers of the heart and the lower chambers of the heart and conducts the electrical impulse from the upper to lower chambers, uh, causing the electrical activity and the mechanical activity of the heart, and also the discovery of a means for electrical pacing of the heart, either the atria, the upper chambers or the lower chambers, which was done by um, Dr. Hein Wellens in the Netherlands. And those two kind of elements uh, were the basis for a subscience of cardiology that became called clinical electrophysiology. And this is what continues today as a means of recording from various parts of the heart and also ablating various abnormal structures in the heart in order to alleviate and actually cure, in many cases, cardiac arrhythmias, that is, disorders of the heart uh, in patients. From the inception of electrophysiology through to today, has there been anything that has kept you engaged, kept you invested in the research? There's an interesting aspect to uh, the recording, and that was a, an adjunct discovery that we made, and that we could not only have that recording, but also pacing from the His bundle. At the time, we thought that that uh, was a kind of interesting connection. Uh, that people could use. Uh, it was used to some extent in the 70s and then kind of faded away until the discovery in uh, 2000 by uh, Dr. Pramod Deshmukh, in which what he did was he took that catheter and he used it as a screw and lead that he could attach to the his bundle. So now he could do his bundle pacing. And the interesting thing is using his bundle pacing for patients with heart failure. Previously, what had been done was to put a catheter into the left ventricle and another catheter in the right ventricle, trying to synchronize the activity of the two chambers in order to get a much more effective uh, ejection of blood so that the heart failure could be ameliorated. In this way, with a single catheter, one could produce this synchronization and uh, get the 
the same kind of result or even better result with patients in heart failure. And that continues today. It's, it's now become one of the, uh, the major ways in which we, we uh, do something called cardiac resynchronization therapy. Now, when it comes to clinical electrophysiology and also all of the lab work and your work as a physician, how do you find that those kind of very disparate worlds of interacting with people, interacting with research, and then interacting with microscopic, damn near atomic detail of physiology, how do they relate to each other? Do they fit together? And have you found that one has helped your understanding of the other? Well, it certainly was my good fortune that uh, starting at the Staten Island Research Hospital, from that time until the present, I have always been collaborating with uh, clinical electrophysiologists. Uh, until this day, I'm on the faculty at the Department of Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center and uh, continue my collaboration with the faculty at the Cardiovascular Institute. My continuation of uh, research has not really been limited to uh, the work that we did with his, the his bundle. What uh, it really was, was a template for a continuing collaboration so that we, we would do our basic science studies and then use that information to bring it to um, fruition in the clinical arena. And that was why I continued to have this collaboration. For example, in 1973, um, we came across a, another interesting uh, structure in the heart, which most people had thought to be a ligament. It's called the ligament of Marshall, discovered by John Marshall in 1850. But we found that there was a continuation of atrial uh, tissue from the coronary sinus into this ligament of Marshall. And at the time, it was just seemed to be a kind of um, recording that uh, people could make. But eventually what happened again, the clinical electrophysiologist found that it was a critical area for the production of permanent uh, and persistent atrial fibrillation. And therefore it could be ablated very easily because there was a vein that ran within that ligament of Marshall. And um, uh, Dr. Valdemano and his associates were able to inject alcohol into that vein so that they could destroy the ligament of Marshall. We called it a tract of atrial activity, which was the source of persistent atrial fibrillation. So that occurred only recently, uh, I think in the last uh, three or four years. So this was another interesting aspect that occurred as a result of our basic studies in cardiac uh, electrophysiology. Uh, this was not the only one that uh, kind of followed this template. The other one was uh, a recent discovery by us that we could stimulate the vagus nerve, which innervates the heart through a an, a non-invasive area called the tract, the, the tragus. The tragus is the, the uh, protuberance, the anterior protuberance of the ear, and it has the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So under those circumstances, we were able to show that the vagus nerve played a very important role in atrial fibrillation. And again, it became a means by which we could use stimulation, which was non-invasive at the tragus of the ear in order to control atrial fibrillation. So this was another aspect of this template of connection between the basic science studies and the clinical electrophysiology. Now, I've got a note here regarding ganglionic plexi. Is that leading into that? Thank you for bringing it up. 
Uh, it goes back to the fact that I did a sabbatical in 1989 uh, at the University of Montreal. Actually, it was at the hospital connected with, the, with McGill University. The discovery of the ganglionated plexi, and these are neural structures which are found uh, at the entrances of the pulmonary veins. Why is that important? Because, again, let me give you a short history. In 1998, Dr. Hasseguer in France and his associates discovered that inflammation of the, air, of the pulmonary veins was producing high levels of activity, which was then propagated into the atrium and producing atrial fibrillation. And what they did was they were able to take a, uh, an electrode catheter place it at the origin of these pulmonary veins so that they could, using radio frequency energy, ablate the pulmonary vein entrances. And in fact, they were able to um, rid the patient of recurrences of atrial fibrillation. The interesting thing that we found when Dr. We worked with Dr. Uh, Andrew Armour uh, in, in Montreal, he was the one who, and uh, with uh, others, discovered these ganglionated plexi, these collections of uh, neural structures at the entrances of these pulmonary veins. And uh, at the time, he was interested in finding out how these structures would correlate with the uh, mechanical activity of the heart. What we found was uh, in, uh, actually we did these studies in 2000, 2004 uh, and continued with uh, our Chinese colleagues afterwards that these ganglionated plexi, which were interesting, localized at the pulmonary veins, were also sites of inflammatory activity that could cause uh, atrial fibrillation. So we hypothesized that when Dr. Hasseguer was ablating the area of the entrances of the pulmonary veins, they were also ablating these ganglionated plexi. And therefore, there was a definite connection between the ganglionated plexi and atrial fibrillation. The interesting thing, too, is that vagal stimulation, again, from the tragus, could suppress the, this high activity of the ganglionated plexi. What does tragus stimulation look like? It's very simple. You attach a, uh, actually a connection to the a tragus of the ear. So it's a little clip that you can put onto the ear, which actually will be able to stimulate the auricular branch of the vagus, which goes to a certain part of the brain and then goes down to the heart, as well as to other parts of the body. We are working with some people in industry, Dr. David Albert, and what we've done is created a system whereby one could record the electrocardiogram from the tragus so that you, you can actually see when atrial fibrillation would start and then use that device to stimulate in order to suppress atrial fibrillation. We called it a closed loop system. And in fact, we have a uh, patent uh, for, that, uh, for that development. Sounds like a much less invasive way of monitoring things. I'm thinking, you know, something the size of a hearing aid to keep your heart going. A lot of people would be very interested in that. Yes. Well, in fact, several people now are developing these non-invasive closed systems for stimulating and uh, blading the uh, atrial fibrillation. The tragus stimulation that we started in 2004, if you look up uh, PubMed, there are 300 articles uh, relating tragus stimulation, not only to atrial fibrillation, but also to epilepsy and uh, Alzheimer's uh, and uh, depression. Uh, so they now think that, uh, that because 
the, the auricular branch of the vagus not only goes to the viscera of the body, but also goes into the brain and may have important effects in the brain. Now, your more recent work on uh, non-thermal plasma and plant biology feels at a bit of a distance from clinical cardiology. What brought about that shift in research focus? We continued to do basic electrophysiology until oh, about four years ago. At that time, we, we kind of suffered from a uh, political problem to terminate our, our animal studies. So under those circumstances, we were again forced to go to a different area of research that we had, um, we had to leave. My original interest I had a, when I was an undergraduate, I was very interested in botany and invertebrate zoology. And so we were very fortunate to get some laboratory space in the Department of Physiology in order to start some studies that I was very anxious to do for many years, but of course was not able to do because of my studies in cardiac electrophysiology. And so this actually became another area of this, this uh, connection between basic science and uh, clinical electrophysiology. And um, so we uh, started working with uh, plants and animals and uh, our initial study was a, uh, I believe, was a singular discovery that we could produce something called plasma. Remarkably, we found that this hybrid plasma had anti-aging, anti-oxidant, uh, and also anti-dehydration effects, so that we could use it for several applications. Uh, as a result of the studies that we did, we were able to uh, attract the attention of the National Academy of Medicine that was running a Global Catalyst Award. And we received one of those awards for $50,000. That was back in 2020. We now have, on the basis of our progressive research, we have now gone into the second iteration of the NAM uh, contest. And uh, we're trying to show not only the very effects of uh, anti-aging, the antioxidant and the anti-dehydration effects in plants, we can now apply this to uh, animals. We're starting with some um, studies in, in mice. <laughs> 